Hi, this is Sherry Broder, and we're here today with uh, Living Legend Lawyers, and we're very fortunate to have three extremely distinguished lawyers, and um, they all started practicing law in the late 1960s here in Hawaii, and I'm very eager to hear from them about uh, what it was like practicing law then, and you know how they are doing today. So first, I'd like to introduce John Edmonds. He's a lawyer's lawyer, uh, represented three governors, uh, always on the highest list of accomplished lawyers in Honolulu. Um, we have Ed Kemper with us, and Ed is Ed went to Stanford Law School and is also a very famous lawyer here in Honolulu. Also well known for his expertise in automobiles, so I want to just give him fair warning. I have a couple of questions about that. And then we also have John Finney with us today, and uh, John is not just a distinguished lawyer, but also a very successful businessman, and uh, believe it or not, John is now uh, operating uh, Subway sandwich stores in Russia, so we'll have to hear all about that. So I kind of want to start with John and Ed because uh, they came here in the late 1960s and uh, we're very, I'm very interested to learn about what it was like when they practiced law together. So they had a law firm together. John, could I ask you to give us some brief info on uh, what your law firm was called and how you guys, how did, and how you decided to come out here. Sure. Uh, well, Ed and I were partners along with Ian Maddock. It was uh, Maddock, Edmonds, and Kemper, and then Boyce Brown joined us. Now, interestingly, we had each all been with big firms. I was hired out of law school by a firm then called Robertson, Castle, and Anthony, one of the oldest and best. Ed was with Kate Shetty, one of the oldest and best, as was Ian Maddock. And then uh, Boyce Brown had been with Rick Schultz's firm, Quinn, Moore, and Schultz. And um, we believed idealistically that we could form a law firm and devote a third of our time to pro bono work. We each of us had a, a cause that we wanted to put our time into. So what was your Mine cause? Mine was the American Civil Liberties Union. I was president mm -hmm. and chief counsel. Ed will tell you about his, but he was trying to save the Miloli'i fishing village. Ian Maddock was um, doing free work up at the university, but the most important or most significant thing we did was Boyce Brown went full time uh, to fight the existence of the H3 freeway. And I'll never forget, we had a big room that, that was Boyce's room, and he, he was in there, that's all he did. The rest of us uh, tried to work two-thirds of the time to bring in some fees, and the rest of the time for pro bono well, he, work. He actually won those cases, didn't he? Yes. We all won some part of what we were doing, but Boyce's was the most yeah. significant. Yeah, but in the end, the Congress passed a law and preempted uh, Boyce's lawsuit. So hard, today we have each the right. Hard to fight with that much uh, yeah. money and cement. So Ed, what was your case about? Well, I had a number of them, but also we, we actually went to uh, low-income areas and provided pro bono services. We would uh, take turns. It was Clean Valley Homes. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, as a result of that, I was contacted by somebody in that area who was establishing a community health center initially operated out of trailers, believe it or not, oh. a dentist uh, and a doctor. And now that's grown into Kakua Kalini Valley, which is a very large and very successful uh, um, metal, met, medical dental clinic, and also does a lot of work in the area. And I'm still on the board after all of these years, wow. only because of that uh, pro bono effort. Wow. And also I worked on ACLU cases, and uh, other ones similar to that. But Boyce, did spend an awful lot of time on H3, but got preempted by Congress. Life of the big city, I guess. And so how about you, John, when you first started practicing law here in Honolulu, what kind of work were you doing? Well, I came out here with Carl Smith, you know, one of their alums, many, many alums, which I enjoyed greatly. Um, I was a, basically did everything, but primarily corporate law, got into real estate, and even some you know, family law, so I had a general experience and a great experience with them. I spent about four and a half years with Carl Smith, and then went back to San Diego, practice law. I had to take the Cal Bar, even though I'd gone to school in California. I never took it before. 
and that was a nightmare, but we had to get past the attorney's bar. And then I came back out here and practiced law with Jeff Grad, Finney and Grad. We continued to do a lot of securities work and real estate securities work, you know, uh, partnership law. So I had a good broad experience to kind of launch my career in business. I didn't spend a lot of time on pro bono work, but other than keeping some of my friends out of jail, so that was about it. But uh, I guess that's pro bono. We won't name any names, by the well, way. Well, no, I, I won't <laughs> name any names, but you can imagine names. Anyway, uh, but I had a great, good, sound grounding in the law, and, and, and you know, I had an experience working with a big firm and also with my own firm, which is a very small firm, and, and so I benefited greatly from the experience and practicing law in old Honolulu. Uh, there's a lot of gentlemen around and a few, few scallywags, but generally a lot of great guys like these guys. You know? uh -huh. So did you all know each other back then? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. I, actually, I think I spent more time with John, hard as it is to believe, out, out in the surf break off <laughs> that tennis court set when it got big out there on the South Shore. Well. <laughs> but uh, we did, and it's interesting to me, as we're going through this, to note that we were all from big firms. Uh -huh. We all got our starts with old, what you'd call old line or white shoe firms. And in those days, to come out here, you needed to spend a year uh, in apprenticeship before you could take the bar. And it was like a residency for a doctor, and I think it was invaluable. I think we all learned a great deal in that time. It's kind of funny, those law firm offices, big firms would kind of empty out when there was big surf in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, finding a young lawyer, they're out at tennis courts trying to catch a wave, right? Yeah. yeah. Bernie Bays, you and a few other guys. Tom Welch. Tom Welch, indeed. And so how did you decide to come out here, John? I, I was in my third year in law school. I'd gone to Stanford undergrad, USC Law School, and my father, God bless him, came to me and said, you've been working hard. I know you have some friends out in Hawaii. I had a couple of fraternity brothers. Uh -huh. And he gave me a plane ticket, and it came out. Uh, the eminent photographer and architect Boone Morrison was a mm -hmm. fraternity brother of mine. I stayed with Boone and Perry White. And on a, the last day I was here on a fluke that would be like bumping into somebody in the supermarket. What do you do? Oh, I'm finishing law school. Oh, my son-in-law is uh, in a firm and they're looking for new lawyers. It was Dennis O'Connor at Robertson Castle. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. And before I got on yeah. the plane, I had an interview and came back, and that was the beginning. Wow. So how about you, John? What, how did you end up coming out here? Well, you know, this, this, this table bleeds Stanford red, but I was at Stanford <laughs> and I got recruited. You know, I thought, well, what's not to like about going to Stanford for the summer? So I applied for a clerkship. And I got hired by a guy named Bob Bethay, who's the hiring partner of Carl Smith. And he hired me because I was from Oklahoma, and he thought I'd fit great in Hilo. Well, I never made it to Hilo. <laughs> oh, Hilo. Oh, wait, you I was, was going to be his rodeo partner, and that never turned out too well either. But that's how I ended up. It was up your rodeo here. background that made well, it think I you were going to be a perfect fit? Well, it made a big fit. difference. I was lined up with all these people, lining up to interview with Carl Smith. Uh -huh. He hired me. It couldn't have been of any, any other reason. He admits he needed a rodeo partner. So anyway, a rodeo partner with an IQ of 175, <laughs> and a photographic memory. And, uh, well, well, thank you. But no, that was a lot of fun. Wisely, he didn't follow up on the rodeo. Yeah, it's, it is very wise. Yeah, my limited experience with that. But no, you know, I, it was Hawaii. Always struck me as an exotic, attractive place. I grew up in Oklahoma. I'd never seen the ocean until I was went to Stanford. You know, so I mean, uh -huh. I was about 20. 19, so I thought, man, this is great. You know, and the water's warmer out there, they say. And so that was all it took. And, and the guys were, you know, Carl Smith was a great, great firm to, to go to work for. I was privileged to, to work for him, and I learned a lot. And some great, great mentors there, some of the real senior members of the bar here. They're still alive Charlie Wickman, Jim Case, Jim Boyle, who's passed away. I, I mean, I learned a lot and learned it fast and learned it hard. So, you know, uh, it wasn't all play, but there was a lot of play. You know, it was a lot of fun living here. So it once, still is. So once you, you came here, did you decide that was it? You weren't going back to Oklahoma, no way? I had a, I had a moment of weakness, and I went back to California. And yeah. strangely enough, I was sitting in a seminar trying to learn something about California law, although I was a cop member of the California bar. I knew nothing about it, of course, you know, other than what was on the bar exam. And I sit there, and some guy was bragging about his tan. He said he just got back from Hawaii, and I'm sitting there, and it's kind of a gray, cold day, and <laughs> the 
someplace. I was interior San Diego. I said, what am I doing here? I'm going back to Hawaii. You know, I've got a ticket and i got a place. So that brought me back. So always, always pulled me back. And more yeah. the people and the, more the people and the, as much as the climate and stuff, you know. You just miss yeah. your friends when you leave there. Yeah. yeah. And how about you, Ed? How did you end up coming out here? And why did you decide to stay? Uh, well, just one minor correction. I went to George Washington Law School. Okay. Stanford. So okay. I, was no, no. I was in Washington. I was in Washington. I didn't say that you went to Stanford. I did? Okay. okay. All right. Sorry. Anyway, so I worked at the SEC as an intern or slave, as okay. violating the 14th yeah. Amendment, among other things. But, uh, and I, I had gone to Florida uh, spring break one time, and I said, why am I living in this lousy climate? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. It was April, and it was warm. And I said, you know, we have horrible winters, and two hot summers, and I said, I think I'm going to send my resumes out to warm slots. And one of those was Hawaii, because what I did is I got Martindale and Hubble, you know, and I just send out resumes. Mm -hmm. And in November, in some horrible weather, I get a call from Fred Shuddy. He says, I'm coming to Washington, D.C. to do some business, and I'd like to talk to you. So he calls me up to his hotel room, and we chit-chat. And he says to me at the end, he said, uh, We'd like to fly you out in December to Hawaii to see <laughs> about uh, joining our firm possible. Yeah. It took me about a microsecond, and I said, well, I'll be happy to. <laughs> that was the so easiest yes ever. Huh? I flew out uh, to here, and they gave me the grand tour, and I said, I kind of like this place. I had been to Los Angeles and D.C. as possibilities, and I said to my wife, I said, well, I think we should do it. Uh, there was only one little problem. Our son had just been born, and we had to, of course, get across the country. So I call up the automotive guy that I am, this agency that I know about that needs to have cars transported <laughs> from the <laughs> East Coast to the West Coast. And we got in this old Chevy, uh -huh. threw the kid in the back seat, and drove across country, got a plane flight to here, and moved what little limited belongings we had, and here we are. So how did you and John end up? going into practice together. I think that was probably Ian. Ian. We both knew both, Ian. Yeah. We were all three of us yeah. unhappy with the life in a big firm. It was right. wonderful training. As John Finney said, uh, the mentors there were the finest lawyers in the city, no question. He probably picked the top 20, and they would have all been senior partners in our right. respective yeah. firms. But it, after a couple of years, it started to feel stultifying. And, uh, Ian and Ed and I got together and talked, and uh, felt like a good fit, and off we went. And we were—it was an idealistic time. It was all hell was breaking loose. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was yeah. heating up, but it was also a time when young people and young lawyers, among them, thought we might be able to change things. Right. And uh, so it was driven a lot by idealism. Well, I mean, the uh, idea that part of your law firm was a, you know, a big commitment to doing pro bono public interest work. I think that's that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, now, of course, the Supreme Court has a rule. People are supposed to spend a certain number of hours every year doing pro bono, but e even that is a very small sliver of time compared to what you folks were willing to make a commitment for. So that's, that's something uh, for us to uh, let the uh, younger people know about, that there was a time when people we're really making that kind of a commitment. I, I, I also want to also agree with John about the training that I received at Case because they had four departments. And what they did was you rotated through those departments. So you got a feel for each one. One was insurance, yep. defense, taxation, corporate law, and I can't remember what the, maybe what the third, fourth one was real estate. So you really were trained well. Uh -huh. uh, so I had, you know, uh, an area of expertise in all of those areas. Not that I ever wanted to practice tax law. That was <laughs> not too exciting. The other thing that was going on out here at the time was uh, they were paying, it, they weren't paying much by way of salaries, but the salaries yeah. were competitive with what Wall Street was paying. Mm -hmm. I think my starting salary was $6,000 a year, but it matched what they were paying on Wall Street. And that, that was a big point. They were getting good people to come out here and be lawyers. There's a much bigger spread and discrepancy now. Oh, now there's a huge yeah. discrepancy. So we're just going to take a short break uh, for a commercial from Think Tech Hawaii. So. 
uh, living legends. Uh, we have three distinguished lawyers with us today, all legends in their own right. And we can take a short break for Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. Hi, welcome back <coughs> to Think Tech Hawaii. We're having a very interesting discussion today with three living legends, lawyers of Hawaii. Uh, all three have started practicing law in Hawaii in the late 1960s. So we are very pleased to have John Edmonds with us, John Finney, and Ed Kemper. So uh, welcome back, everybody. You know, I just wanted to take a minute to find out from you folks, what was it like practicing law back then in the late 60s, early 70s? I mean, do you think that people were polite? Were they friendly? Um, do you think that it was different than it is today in terms of the professional uh, relationships? I, I don't perceive any real difference. Obviously, the bars got much larger. And of course, you don't know everybody as, as well as you did then when it was very small. I, the, the major difference is t technology. Uh, I remember having a dictating machine and you know, carbon paper and all that stuff. There weren't computers. Uh, and you had a much bigger staff as a result just trying to muddle through uh, paperwork. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest contrast I can see. Not so much the people. I mean, most of them are very nice. And Cooperative. There are some exceptions, but mostly cooperative. That's because you practice transactional law <laughs> <laughs> in the courthouse. It's a little so, what do you think, John? Is the is the <clears throat> litigation, civil litigation, criminal defense work has that changed a lot in the last thirty years? I think or? it has. I think. <clears throat> I guess I better say forty years. Forty, forty years. 40 years yeah. Forty-eight for me. I can't 50, believe I'm okay. that, that yeah, far right. along. But I think what's changed. Uh -huh. it, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. We've had a, a technological revolution, a data processing revolution, but with it has come a decentralization of the court process. And what I mean specifically is in the old days, on a Monday morning, there was one judge, Yasutaka mm -hmm. Fukushima. He had a calendar. <clears throat> he heard every pending motion in every civil case. And you'd go down there, because you had to, and everybody admitted in the bar who was practicing trial law was there. Mm -hmm. And you would rise or fall or sink, swim, live, mm -hmm. die, and some of it was very brutal in that courtroom. And the word got around very quickly about who knew what they were doing and who didn't. Now, the same thing was true on the criminal bench. Because I was, I was doing both after a very short period of time. All the cases for arraignment and plea, not the trials, but all the arraignments and pleas, Judge Allen Hawkins had started at 8 in the morning. you go down there, and there'd be 90, 100 lawyers. Yeah. and their clients spilling out into the lanai. But everybody knew everybody. It was pretty hard to cross somebody earlier in the week when you knew you were, or the week before when you knew you were going to see them Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Now, there were a lot of jerks and difficult people to deal with, but there was an enormous amount of collegiality. And I, there is now, there can be now, but there was now you try to go down there, and there's no there there. I've said this before. You try to go down there, and there's no there there. Yeah. Uh, most courtrooms are not heavily populated when there's a trial going on. For better or worse, the media doesn't cover as much as I think they used to. They have access. They have cameras in the courtroom now, which we never had. Videos in the courtroom, which we never had. But in terms of interaction within the bar, there was a lot more. And uh, frankly, I miss it. 
Yeah. Well, I was just uh, at a Ninth Circuit panel discussion yeah. before yeah. this, and the Ninth Circuit now it has live streaming, so you can watch all the oral yeah. arguments online. You don't have to go down to yeah. watch them, and they archive them as well. I'm not sure if they're loading them onto YouTube yet, but uh, probably that's going to be the next thing. So, uh, John, what do you think about, well, you went into the business world. I mean, do you think the business, in the business world, it's different today in Honolulu than it was then? Was it, back then, was it like John and Ed are talking about in the legal profession where, you know, people are friendly with each other and know each other pretty well and um, have a good understanding of who's got talent and who doesn't, who's got the ethics? Well, I think it's changed dramatically, you know, I mean, the world's changed and the business has changed and the law has changed. There's just so many more people involved. I yeah. mean, entrepreneurship in Honolulu has upset all the old line firms. Most of them disappeared. And back in the day, there was four or five big firms and they all had a staff and those people had a hierarchy and there were those people that were top of the hierarchy and they all headed to the Pacific Club at lunch. Mm -hmm. It's not like that anymore. So when you talk about the hierarchy, you're talking about like the big five. Well, Amtrak I'm talking, there and, was, yeah. You're not I'm talking about the big law firms. You're talking well, the big law firms were same thing. pretty much the same way, I would say. Yeah. You know, there, there was a hierarchy among firms, and now, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good because yeah. young people can rise or sink or swim on their own a lot more, perhaps, than mm -hmm. would be the case in the older days. It's not structured as well. Uh, okay, now you got it. terrifying place to do business than it was in those days. I think you could pretty well I, I there there were some known no 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 more of a challenge now than perhaps you have to be a little quicker on your feet than you did back when I first started out. That's my sense of it. So when you f first started out in the business world in Hawaii, it was a lot of uh, transactions uh, based on relationships, you know, who you knew and what kind of a relationship you had with them? Mm, uh, my experience. I no. mean, I think it was strictly hardball from the very beginning. You know, I think people have always held real estate their deals close here, and they've always we've had really, I think that more than it's probably harder to get into business because of the way things are structured, the ownership of property and stuff was structured here when I started out. It's, it's begun to loosen up, of course, with the help of the Bar Association creating the sale of fee, simple, you know, it's changed, that's changed the, a whole lot of people's mm -hmm. net worth, changed the way people think in terms of long term, so it's a very dynamic Thing. And I think that's been continual change since not, I've been in business and I've been associated with the law because I've been involved on both sides of it, not yeah. both sides of the, I mean, as a defendant and a plaintiff, and, you know, I've been involved in the process. So, uh, you know, I, I just think that it's a more exciting, maybe more, more upside opportunity today for a young lawyer or a young business person than that might have been the case. I, I don't know. It, it was well, you don't think the real estate market in Hawaii is still dominated by uh, large entities like the commercial properties? So many of them are owned by well, that uh, eight, that REIT from the mainland that well, bought the Damon commercial properties and the Campbell commercial properties. HRT, I think. Well, there's new the, entities coming in, like yeah. Howard Hughes Corporation. Yeah. Who'd ever heard, have thought of them? I mean, you've heard of them, but I mean, all of a sudden <coughs> they're a big player. So that has changed you know there's no no uh, and there's still some local developers that are you know very strong and have done a lot of work John but you know I, I think that really big money has come in internationally into here and I see a real estate market that's very very strange right now so but that's another subject I think John's being a little too modest and yeah it hasn't chimed in yet but what I noticed was that Clients back in the beginning of the 70s were willing, business clients, were willing to leave their big firms, and if they saw John Finney or Ned Kemper, 
Yes. They'd say, all right, I'm going to go with talent. I'm going to go there. Uh, and not to toot my own horn, but I had that experience. Chris Hemeter became a client of mine mm -hmm. for 17 years on transactional business-related work. Uh, that, I think that never would have happened at an earlier time here, and it never, never was happening then in cities like New York or Chicago. The, the big firms had captive clients. I mean, they, they couldn't lasso them and tie them down and make them stay. <laughs> as much as they, they tried. Yeah, as much as they tried. But here, I know when I met Chris Emmeter, it, it had to do with a partner in a big firm who was a friend of both of ours and introduced us. I know John is very modest about his own experience. When he was practicing law, he had some very big business clients uh -huh. come to him and say, hey, I want to go with talent. And I know you did too, Ed. Speaking of talent, I, I want to go back to hark, hark back to uh, the bar way back when. Uh, one night I was working late in the law library, you know what that is, where they have books about yeah. law, and you could go there at night. And I'm sitting there, I'm probably alone, and I hear this pounding on the door. So I go open the door, and there's Judge Hawkins. And Judge Hawkins says to me, I need a witness. For what, Judge? A marriage. I was home, <laughs> drinking my champagne, and these kids want to get married. Rawr, 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 rawr. Come down and witness this wedding. <laughs> so we go down in his chambers, and this poor couple there, and then it's like you turn the switch. He was Mr. Nice. This is a lovely yeah. couple, and they want to get married. Mr. Kemper is volunteered here to be a witness <laughs> to your wedding. <laughs> so he goes through the ceremony, and it's just beautiful, and he did an excellent job. And he signs the papers, and then they leave. He says, God, Jim, Chris, why are they bothering you? I'm going to go home. Goodbye, Kemper. <laughs> that was it. Listen, when you're a criminal judge all day long, presiding yeah, over right. rape, murder, and other felonious misconduct, and you have a chance to smile for half an hour. And, that's and right. Well, and also, when you were called in the criminal, when I was with Kate, we would do, quote, pro bono work, and there would be criminal cases, and they'd call everybody up, and it was whoever raised their hand first. It wasn't the order or the uh -huh. list. Yeah. It was whoever got his attention. And then he would call you up, and you would plead not guilty and move on. It was really something. And that's when we only had really one courthouse, where the Supreme Court was and the circuit courts were. I don't even know where district courts were at that time. But he was a character, but he was an incredibly fair man. He really right. believed that yeah. people had the right to bail. Yeah. You know, the Constitution says that, but Judge Hawkins, on a day-to-day, case-by-case basis, said, yep got a right to bail, and I'm going to set bail, not bail that you can't make, but bail you can make. Right. Okay, we're going to take one more uh, commercial break right now, so we're going to take just a few minutes, and we'll be back with uh, Living Legends, our lawyer, our three lawyers that we have here today, and uh, we're taking a break for Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Hi, Jay. Hi, Hi Keith. <laughs> My name's Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Uh, you got a great show going, thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah, so what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from, from academia, uh, from uh, pr practitioners of international affairs. Sometimes we have uh, military officials. Sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream That's media. the difference, isn't it? Exactly. That's your, you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do. Right. We're and trying that's to, why we like you so much. We're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective, an intelligent perspective on what's going on and where both sides of the story, or even when there's more than two sides, we try to cover every angle. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech, is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. I watch it every week. Thanks very much. Why don't yeah. you guys watch it every week, too, okay? 4.45 to uh, 4 to 4.45 every Tuesday. <laughs> Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leesom, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so, I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii 
to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha. We're back here for the final segment of Living Legends of Hawaii. We have three distinguished attorneys with us, John Edmonds, John Finney, and Ed Kemper. So I want to bring us up to the present now. And I know, Ed, you have a great interest in automobiles. That is correct. And you're quite uh, famous for it, actually. Very and famous. so um, I thought maybe we could share with some of our viewers some of your thoughts on the green cars coming out these days. Uh, you know, what do you think about the change of automobiles to electric cars? And uh, do you think that pretty soon we're all going to have solar on a solar PV on our roofs and our own Tesla battery and uh, be driving uh, Teslas or Chevy Volts? Well, I think that's first of all, uh, people don't realize, that, but by by the year. Uh, 2025, we essentially have to go to an average of 55 miles per gallon. You think the current average is roughly 25 to 30, depending on what statistics you look at. There's only a couple of ways you're going to go from that number to 55. One is electric, because electric vehicles are much more efficient. A uh, typical gas mileage rating for electric vehicles is over 100 miles per gallon. That they use an equivalent formula, how much energy it takes to move the car the distance. Um, of course, then you have the hybrids, which is the Prius and the Volts and the things of that nature, where you go for a certain distance of electric, and eventually you'll have to have the engine on because you're running out of battery power, uh, versus the Tesla, which is completely electric. But the Tesla, of course, is more expensive, but you get a much greater range and much greater speed. So those are the directions we're going to have to go. Also, we have to lighten the vehicles. A classic example of that, you've probably seen ads for it. Ford F-150, a big, heavy truck. They make it now of aluminum, 700 pounds lighter, better gas mileage. So that vehicle will have to go more electric, smaller engines, lighter weight, carbon fiber even, which is very expensive at this point, but that makes it super light. So that's the trend. No question about it. So how did you get from law to automobiles? I wrote some articles for the Hawaii Bar Journal when the uh, publisher said, I want to sell some ads for, to automobile companies or dealerships. So I wrote little mini reviews. And then when the advertiser split from the Star Bulletin, I wrote a letter to the Star Bulletin. It was kind of a joke about airlines and stuff like that. And they said, by the way, if you want a review of cars locally, I'll be happy to write some. The next day I get a call and said, come on down, let's talk. So every week I would test a car and write about it for this star bulletin. And then uh, the fellow that was associated with the Hawaii Bar Journal had a friend who had a video shop and met right next to him and said, let's do a TV show based upon your reviews. I said, fine. So did you end up with any uh, automobile-related clients? Do you remember no, representing no, no. any car dealerships or anything like that? I don't represent any car dealerships, probably because that would be a conflict. Oh, okay. but, all, but I do represent people associated with the automobile business, uh, some of them, but not many of them. Um, so anyway, TV show was launched on another station, and uh, so I do car reviews, and we go to car events and talk cars. Well, that's very interesting. John, I wanted to ask you about doing business in Russia. Now, you've uh, gone from being a practicing lawyer in a law firm and doing hamburgers and Burger King, and now I understand that you are, you are involved in uh, businesses in Russia. So how does a person from Hawaii, a businessman from Hawaii, get involved in doing business in Russia? You have to have an unerring knack for getting into trouble with <laughs> faraway places. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, I got involved because I got heavy into franchising. And, you know, there's a lot of law involved with franchising. And I got to be pretty expert about it, being, bringing Burger King here with my partner, Robert Pulley, and selling that and being involved. But I got approached to some 
couple of partners of mine who are also lawyers and wanted to get the subway sandwich franchise rights for the nation of Russia, actually the Soviet Union. And then that exploded and we ended up with the nation of Russia. To make a very long story very short, we had our first restaurant in St. Petersburg, Subway Sandwich Restaurant. It was the leading Subway Sandwich Restaurant in the world wow. in volume, in rubles. We were bringing rubles in by the hand cart, you know, and mm -hmm. we got that taken away by the Russian mob. We had oh. a partner. So that, that the next step was about seven or eight years of international law trying to get our store back with the, in the International Court of Justice at The Hague and the U.S. government. So we got a fair amount of international legal experience, but we finally got it back, and mainly due to my partners. Now we have 700 franchise stores going over there. So it's the biggest Western franchise in the nation of Russia. We, as I said, we had the whole Soviet Union, but they're... <laughs> it looks like Putin's trying to put it back together, so I don't know. Yeah. We, we don't, don't get the accretion, we just get the original nation of Russia. It's been a very exciting time, but it's a, a long, and, and a, it's, you know, it's, it's not the only thing I do, but it, it, it certainly occupies my mind and my interest, and it just goes to show where you, you're in Hawaii, you could end up doing business in Russia, if you're foolish, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have to go there to I do. Look I at go your... there through two or three times a year. I, you know, it's a long trip. It's, yeah. So which, how do you go? Do you go through? I like go to Hong LA Kong? and I meet oh. up with my partners and we fly Aeroflot business class to Moscow and then we end up in our, our office in St. Petersburg. So we'll spend a week or 10 days over there. And you know, it's, it's work, you know, you have to do about yeah. three months work in 10 days. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but, but it's been very exciting. You know, it's, it's a, interesting and, and, and has been very lucrative. Do they have franchise laws there, like we do? Not really. I'm not sure what laws they have there. We have a lot of lawyers, but it's, uh, trust me, we need a John Edmonds over there to plead our cases. And maybe an Ed Kemper. I mean, it's, a, it's a very challenging legal yeah. environment. You know, you, you, it's a good place to keep your head down right now, particularly. So, John Edmonds, I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, maybe one of your more interesting cases that you're doing now. You've done so many incredible cases that really set the standard for different areas of the law, like the case that when you represented Mrs. Toledo and you used the battered woman defense for the very first time and were successful at it. So I'm just wondering, okay, today, what are you doing, John, that is going to change the, the nature of law in our community? Uh, well, I'd love to talk about a particular case I have going to trial shortly, but as everybody here knows, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I'd rather talk about the Toledo case. Okay, that would be great. Because I yeah. think it was not because of me, but because of a very committed judge and a unique expert witness. I think it set a, a high water mark for what's permissible in a courtroom now when, when there are battered women. Mrs. Toledo had been a woman battered by her husband. She was... Um, originally, uh, before she met and fell in love with Bob Toledo and they raised her children, she was uh, the girlfriend and constant companion of a man named Abe Saperstein. And Abe Saperstein was the, the fellow who founded and put together the Harlem Globetrotters. Oh, wow. He was a businessman out of New York. He found these poor, I don't know if you call them black or African American, highly talented individuals but they couldn't rub two nickels together and get much done. He put together the traveling Harlem Globetrotters. He was still married, fell in love with Ms. Toledo, or Kathy Toledo. Her middle name was Kapilani. She was a descendant of Queen Kapilani. And there are a lot of beautiful women, but she was spectacular. I've seen pictures of her. She was the opening act for the Harlem Globetrotters in the winter in uh, Sweden. There, before the Globetrotters would take the court, Abe Saberstein would have her come out in a hula skirt and dance the hula to Hawaiian music. <laughs> and people would go crazy. Uh, she moved back here, fell on harder times, married, uh, not financially, but on emotionally harder times. Married Robert Toledo during an argument. Um, she took out a gun and shot and killed him. And um, they indicted her for murder. Uh, it took a year out of my life, and it took the work of a really gifted woman named Lenore Walker, who is still the, the leading expert on battered women in the world. At the time, she had studied more case histories of battered women than anyone. She was a sociologist. Computers had just been invented. They put all the data into the 
computers okay. and it, it started telling them things they didn't know. One of the things it told them was uh, this, uh, it was the answer to the question of why do battered women not just pack up and get out? Why don't they leave the relationship? And there is a controversial theory called learned helplessness that women over time in these relationships can be taught to be helpless. Mm -hmm. Not you, not your friend next door, but women in certain kinds of relationships can be taught by their husbands to be helpless. And they found this in better women shelters. They, they'll put women in shelters to try to protect them. And these guys get through. And sometimes the women will come out and go back with the batterers. She was able to use that theory, <coughs> pardon me, very effectively in courtrooms throughout the country. And she was able to come down here and use it as my expert witness. And as a result, Ms. Toledo walked out a free woman, something that her doctors were telling us openly, it's not a secret, uh, would never have happened if she'd been convicted, they gave her a year to live. She would not have, she was in a bad medical state mm -hmm. and would not have survived in prison. So of, of the things I've done, I'd say that was, it brought me into contact with some very unique people, very unique doctrines. Well, I think that that is certainly something that you're very well known for. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I think that that was something not just uh, that you said here in Hawaii, but you really set a national standard for that. So we're going to have to, unfortunately, leave our three living legends um, for today. And I want to thank each of you, John Edmonds, John Finney, and Ed Kemper, for coming and sharing your very valuable time with uh, not just Think Tech Hawaii, but with everybody who will be watching this show. So thank you very much, everybody. Mahalo nui loa. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech Hawaii. Won't you consider helping Think Tech? We're a 501c3 Hawaii nonprofit corporation, now in our 15th year. Our model and very existence depends on ongoing contributions from our underwriters. We are very appreciative for their support. We're hoping you will consider becoming one of our Think Tech underwriters. Unless our underwriters prefer to be anonymous, we publicize them on thinktechhawaii.com and on our daily email program sent to some 7,500 subscribers, our live stream talk shows, and our OC16 productions. With help from our underwriters, we have developed a high-tech video studio in Pioneer Plaza, and we now live stream 25 talk shows per week, covering science, tech, energy diversification, community, sustainability, and globalism for Hawaii. And we stream our earlier shows all night long. Our live stream is on thinktechhawaii.com. Check it out. We also upload all our shows to YouTube.com, where we get 18,000 views per month. And we broadcast 12 hours per week on Olelo 54 and three and a half hours per week on OC16. We also do monthly luncheon panel programs at the Laniakea, and we write a monthly column for the Honolulu Star Advertiser. We're really active. Our plans this year include improving the coverage, content, and production values of all of our programs and including more issues and guests relating to the neighbor islands, either by Skype or in person. If you agree with our mission, I hope you'll consider helping us. If you have any questions about any of our activities, or if you'd like to discuss our underwriter arrangements, please write to me at j at fidel.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much for considering this suggestion maybe even including you among our underwriters. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech Hawaii, and I approve this message. If you approve of it also, please give us a call.